Hello and, and welcome to another OpenShift Commons briefing. This time it's on persistent storage on Kubernetes and OpenShift. It's a problem that lots of us have faced over the years and um, Jeff Vance and Aaron Boyd have been working on um, and have a very good uh, solution and a lot of techniques for, for working with persistent storage. So hopefully they'll, they'll tell us how to solve our troubles with persistence. And um, the logistics for today um, and as with all OpenShift Commons, is we'll let Jeff and Aaron do 20 to 30 minutes of talking on this. You, while they're talking, you can ask questions in chat, and um, we'll try and answer them in chat. And then afterwards, we'll do um, a Q&A session, and this, and this whole thing takes, um, we have an hour today, so I, I expect um, with this kind of a topic, we'll probably have lots of questions. So what I will do in the Q&A is unmute you, allow you I'll read your question if you type it in chat, and then unmute you for follow-up. Uh, it works pretty nicely, um, and that way we get a really nice, clean, introductory um, video for people in the future to watch. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce, um, let Aaron and Jeff introduce themselves and get started today. So thanks, guys. Thank you, Diane. So my name is Aaron Boyd. Um, I'm with the Emerging Technologies Group. Um, for the Office of Technology for Red Hat, and myself and Jeff Vance both work on improving uh, persistent storage in Kubernetes and OpenShift um, from a complete end-to-end -end point of view in that we are improving the way we debug, um, use, and present storage to our users. Uh, Jeff, if you want to go ahead and give an introduction, I'll start on the second slide after that. Yeah, sure. Okay, I'm Jeff Vance, also working on Aaron's team in the Emerging Tech Group. And uh, right now, our focus in this group has been on uh, usability and completeness in the OpenShift storage uh, solutions. And uh, we do things from improving documentation to creating pull requests against Kubernetes to add features or fix bugs um, and uh, at, or pull requests for OpenShift itself for the same purposes. So we kind of cover a wide range of activities. Great. So thanks everyone for attending today. Let's go ahead and get started. So um, as you know, containers are ephemeral. And so what would motivate a person to need persistent storage then if they're using containers? So the first reason is that any local files running inside that container will not exist outside its lifetime. So in the event you've deployed your application within OpenShift and running your container and producing data, once that pod terminates, your data will be lost. In addition, if you're running jobs, which typically are done efficiently to run in parallel, the pods will not be able to share data between them without the persistent storage enabled to read from a location to share that data. Um, also, um, data analytics, which is coming soon in OpenShift, is one of the drivers of having persistent storage. Let's say that you're running data analytics on your logs to troubleshoot um, a problem within the system. You would need to read from an existing storage uh, location in order to pull that data into OpenShift. And then the last reason is that as Kubernetes being a container model may reschedule nodes as appropriate um, with, the, with them coming in and out of existence, the pods could possibly land on a separate node than where they were originally scheduled. Therefore, you know, we can't depend on local storage to always be where we expect it to be within the container infrastructure. So within OpenShift, we offer a, con a very improved user experience around storage. We have two native storage platforms that we offer um, that are you know, tightly coupled and run well within Red Hat, both Red Hat Gluster Storage and Red Hat Ceph Storage. Uh, Kubernetes includes, uh, you know, with it, additional volume security options, but OpenShift includes a lot more than that. Um, there's pre-configured uh, plugins within OpenShift that allow us to run different cloud providers like uh, Google GCE or Amazon EBS, Azure. Um, and so what we offer is that when you deploy OpenShift and you use storage, all this is contained. You don't have to install any extra things to, um, to enable persistent storage. 
So consuming clustered storage. Um, there are very two very specific use cases when we talk to customers and developers about how they're going to use persistent storage. So the first one is you know, specific known storage. And this is commonly referred to in the community as PET, though uh, that name is not well liked. And this is really a non-fungible storage, meaning that you know where it is, uh, you want to locate it specifically either within a data center or uh, within a node, within a cloud provider, and you don't just throw it away and get a new one. You know, you want this storage to be within a specific location. Maybe you're sharing it within projects or teams. You manage where it's located. And as given in the analytics example, you need the specific storage volume um, in order to get that data. Maybe you have a legacy database that you're pulling data from that would fall under this you know first use case of specific known storage and the data has business value must be backed up so maybe you're finding the cure for cancer you'll want to record that data and keep it in a safe place there's also a second uh, generic storage non-specific use case and this is uh, widely used for testing um, and for you know generating results that may not be kept maybe you're doing uh, streaming analytics and you're only keeping partial parts of the data. And this is referred to as cattle storage in that um, your storage can be interchanged without it affecting the way that your application runs. It's usually qualified by a number rather than a name. You simply are asking an admin for some storage, some, you know, you don't care where, you don't care what kind, you just want storage to store your data at the moment. Um, it's managed the same as normal storage, it's just not allocated in the same thing and you have an indifference to where it lands on. So this would not be local storage. This would not be empty or hoster as part of the volumes that are also included within Kubernetes. And it's replicated rather than backed up. So it scales up and down very easily. Um, it's not maintained across each one of the nodes. And the last um, differentiator for storage that's important to understand when we talk about storage and containers are um, file on block. So this is really the raw volume of storage. It's usually T4, XFS. It has a single owner, so this is not your typical shared storage. You know, we're talking about Ceph RBD, we're talking about AWS EBS, we're talking Cinder. Um, and they actually, when you, when you claim that storage, you're altering the underlying permissions of the ownership, and we call that a takeover within storage. Um, and most cloud storage platforms fall underneath this. Shared file, which most people are commonly drawn to and have used in the past, are you know, NFS and GlusterFS. So when you look at the file system and you look at the permissions, they're the same way as if you were looking at you know, an LS in your directory on Linux. Um, the access is controlled via the file level, the typical POSIX permissions you're comfortable with and the owner group, and the underlying storage permissions are not altered like they are on the file on block. Okay. Jeff, you can take the next slide. This is Jeff. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so Aaron's motivated um, some characteristics of storage and the need for storage, which is the need's probably pretty obvious to everyone on the call. Um, and now with that background of uh, cattle versus pet storage and um, block versus shared storage, I'm gonna go on and describe more specific uh, storage features of OpenShift. Uh, so OpenShift uses Kubernetes as its underlying framework, but OpenShift adds quite a bit on top of Kubernetes. And, and, um, and that affects also storage, as you'll see later on. So um, the, the OpenShift Kubernetes um, framework for storage consists of a persistent volume and a persistent volume claim. And we'll go over the claims shortly. Uh, a persistent volume known as a PV um, is a global resource available to your OpenShift cluster. So it's not specific to a particular project or namespace. It is global for the entire cluster. And the idea is that a persistent volumes that are defined and created by a storage administrator, someone with that type of role. Um, and, and a JSON or YAML file is what's going to most typically 
define your persistent volume, and it's defined by an expert in that type of storage. So they know, for instance, in a Gluster trusted pool, they know the endpoints, the IP addresses of each Gluster node. Uh, for a Ceph RDB storage, they know the secret. They, they, they know the author, uh, the admin authorization key and other features like that that a developer probably wouldn't know. They'd have to ask someone and it would slow down the process. But the storage administration uh, individual has that knowledge and they create the persistent volume uh, and they can create multiple persistent volumes. Um, and each different type of storage, like Aaron mentioned, OpenStack, Cinder, or AWS, NFS, Gluster, um, they are, um, when they are defined in the, in the PV spec, we are referencing a plugin or a storage adapter. So there's an NFS plugin, there's a Gluster plugin, there's a Ceph RDB plugin, and, and many more. And, and many more are being developed um, as we speak. It's uh, the storage vendors are all jumping in and they want their own plugin also available in Kubernetes and OpenShift. Um, then a developer will be able to claim that storage through a, a resource called a persistent volume claim, which I'll show later. Um, and once, but once uh, the point here is once a PV is claimed, it is bound to that claim and therefore it's not available to any other claims. Um, However, you can have more than one PV defined in your cluster that references the same physical underlying storage. So I could have 10 NFS PVs if I want. And those 10 NFS PVs could eventually get claimed. And then the pods that are using those claims would have access to the same shared storage infrastructure. Okay, next slide, Aaron. Okay, so this is just a graphic, but um, it's basically saying what I just said. You've got in there Kubernetes or OpenShift in the center, and on the top left, you have your on-prem storage plugins or adapters, and on the bottom, sort of right, you have uh, uh, cloud storage, and it's just really just showing you a list of what we have um, today, and that list is growing. In fact, we just merged in Kubernetes um, a, a, a whole, another storage vendors um, plugin uh, yesterday. So, um, so it's a it's a dynamic area right now. Um, and another thing, just so in case I don't say it later, is that when you get these different storage plugins or adapters with OpenShift or Kubernetes, you get them in the same single binary. So, so when OpenShift is installed in your cluster you don't have to install storage separate. It's, it's, baked into, it's baked in to OpenShift. Okay, Aaron, next slide. Okay, and another um, uh, sort of, this is, um, this slide sort of motivates why there's a separation between a persistent volume and a claim to that volume. And the idea, as I kind of alluded to earlier, is that uh, you have this null, a storage expert creating PVs, um, and then you have the developer, and she just wants to get her application up and running, tested, and deployed, and um, and may not have the in-depth knowledge about the type of storage she's accessing. She doesn't know what the NFS export is or what server the NFS, uh, what I, the IP address of the company's NFS server, but, but, she, but she knows a claim. She, she knows some characteristics of that storage, um, which we'll cover which we'll cover shortly. Um, she knows the access she needs. She wants read-only access, or she knows um, how much storage she needs. She needs uh, two gig. And, uh, and so she can claim it from that level and not worry about the storage details that the storage administrator um, was concerned about. And so it's just the separation of concerns is sort of the motivating factor for the uh, persistent volume and volume claim framework that we have today. Um, if I wanted to say anything else there. Um, no, go ahead, next one, Aaron. I guess the, as the slide's advancing, Aaron will discover, will, will um, describe storage classes, and that's just another uh, invention that will allow, um, um, that, that facilitates the developer to discover more about the storage that she needs to access. Um, so open, so, so we've talked about claims, and this is more details about a claim. 
So um, Kubernetes and OpenShift have this concept of a persistent volume claim, and it's just a request for storage. That's it. And it and it's um, it can be very generic, generic, like I just want um, a gig of storage, and I need read access, or I need read write access, um, or it can be much more specific. You can say I need um, high speed storage, I need um, low cost storage in an eastern United States, um, et cetera. So you can do um, you can be fairly specific. You can be fairly generic, or you can be 100% specific, which we're, we don't have slides to cover, but you can really say, I want that persistent volume right there. That's the one I need. And so you can get to all those levels of abstraction and how you claim your storage. Um, you can, a claim doesn't have to be fulfilled or bound to a persistent volume. If you don't have a PV that matches the characteristics of your claim, that claim just remains in a pending state, ready for a PV to show up that will match what the claim needs. Once that happens, the claim automatically binds to the PV, and then the pod and the containers within that pod can start running. Um, and again, as I said, once a PV is bound to a claim, that PV is unavailable for any other claims. Um, you can have multiple pods within the same project they can all reference the same claim, so you don't need one claim per pod. Um, and as I said before, you can have multiple PVs describing the same underlying physical storage. And the next slide, Aaron. And this is just a, um, this is our first slide that just shows you the open view console GUI, and um, it's a really nice tool. Um, and we, our team's been involved with adding some storage features to the to the GUI. Um, and this one's just a simple one where I can request um, a claim. I can create a claim, and I can name the claim, and this, uh, this screen will be, um, more features will be added to the screen shortly where we can do um, label selectors, like I, I want gold storage or I want um, high uh, IOP storage, et cetera. But right now we're just showing, I, I can name my claim, it, it will be in my project. Um, I can de describe what kind of access I need and how much storage I need. I create, I click the create button and I'll see the next slide, Aaron. And I'll see a list of claims that are available to me in my project. And I think this slide will also be augmented uh, shortly where uh, characteristics of the claim, like I said, uh, AWS, US zone East, or something like that will also be visible. But the top claim there, OC-PVC1, uh, I'll show you how we get to that claim in the next slide. So this is just a summary, a graphical summary of my claims. And this slide is a fragment of YAML. YAML and JSON are just a markup language that um, lets me describe a resource or an object. And this is a, this is a YAML fragment for a pod. Um, and in that description of the pod, there's many, many attributes, but one of them is the volumes that that pod will have access to. And you can see here that we've said the volume is going to be referenced by a persistent volume claim, and the name of that claim is OC-PVC1. So the so we have this indirection here. I have a pod, and the pod references a claim. The claim references a PV, and the PV describes the underlying physical storage asset. So that's our kind of our level of indirection to get from the application to the storage. And um, there's a, a, an OpenShift command that would let me create this pod. And, um, and then the, the pod um, will do its thing, which uh, I think we cover later. It, it basically, as far as storage goes, uh, the pod will be scheduled on one of the nodes in my OpenShift cluster. And then um, part of the pod startup process will be to, um, do the, to, to run the storage adapter or the plugin. Um, and uh, that plugin will uh, attach a volume, format the volume if that's needed, 
mount the volume on the host that the pod is running on automatically. The pod now has access through the mount uh, um, to that storage. And then when the pod uh, terminates, um, the reverse is done, the, the, uh, it's unmounted, et cetera. And that's all done by the storage plugins. Okay, next, Aaron. So thank you, Jeff, for covering, <clears throat> you know, what the framework for persistent volume, persistent volume claims looks like. Um, we leverage this foundation of the framework for using persistent volumes and then their claims. We have added some rich features to enable storage to be even easier. As you noticed in the previous slides, it's a little bit intensive for both the administrator and the user to create the claims, even though we've created a UI, um, there still is a usability issue in that a user should just be able to say, I want storage, and if it doesn't exist, please go off and create it for me. And so a feature um, that was integrated in 3.1 as an alpha feature, and in 3.3 will be further enhanced, um, is called dynamic provisioning. And basically, this allows the user, the developer, to dynamically ask for storage to be provisioned on demand. Um, if they have the um, permissions to invoke a provisioner, this is done on the fly. And today, cloud providers are the basic supporters of this in the alpha version, GCE, Cinder, and Amazon EBS but eventually we will have provisioners for even on-prem storage. Um, and so this bypasses the need for the storage um, or cluster administrator to go off and provision the storage. As Jeff had mentioned in a previous slide, a user can make a claim and a claim can go unfulfilled as pending because the storage asset doesn't exist. By leveraging dynamic provisioning, a user is allowed to request storage and have it provisioned on the fly and it's controlled using quotas. So that allows the um, admin to have the controls that, you know, a developer doesn't go out and provision a terabyte of storage every five minutes on AWS CBS. So once they do this, they can automatically use the, the volumes within their application. Another feature that Jeff was alluding to is called storage classes. And storage classes is really you can think about it as a quality of service that you're offering to your users. So an administrator, again, goes off and configures uh, different levels of storage, creating a taxonomy of what the storage should look like. So they may have, uh, you know, Ceph or Fiber iSCSI and different labels associated with that type of storage. Your fast storage might be gold, storage in that it's the most premium storage that a user can request. Um, your fiber might be a little bit slower or less capacity, therefore having uh, silver and then bronze might be your iSCSI. Um, the administrator can put different features within these classes to allow a user to just select a level of service with an expectation that they're going to have. And it's kind of a a recipe, so there's many different aspects within that label that the administrator can also assign. Therefore, the developer, instead of making a claim, actually uses what will be a new API, API object called storage class to request this storage. And it will allow us to better organize the classes into a catalog so a user can search for what they're looking for. Because typically, um, the idea of Kubernetes and storage is that the user doesn't have to know much about it. They can just simply request it. So storage classes offers another level of a abstraction with a little better description of what they need depending on their applications uh, wants. Uh, the last feature um, that will be in the next release of OpenShift is called a storage selector. So a storage selector allows um, an administrator to create labels which are uh, intrinsic to Kubernetes on the storage to give it, define better the characteristics of that storage. In this example I have here, we have two different persistent volumes um, in AWS EBS. We have one in the availability zone of East and the other in the availability zone of West. Uh, the user may care about this. 
uh, depending on latency within their application, um, or maybe they have uh, co, you know, applications that exist in that same geography, so they care about this specific label. They're less concerned with a certain quality of service, and they're more concerned about a specific feature of that storage. Storage selectors allow the user within their claim request to request a specific label of that selector. So within the claim request, as Jeff showed earlier, the, the snippet, we can then add a selector column, and then we can put in a claim request and have it match US East 1, and then we are matched to that specific PV. So this allows the user to be very specific about what they're doing um, in terms of their application and where their storage is being kept. But it still is um, abstracting the process of creating these PVs from the user. Um, the last feature that I want to talk about is a pretty exciting one um, that has just been released, and this is Container Native Storage Solution, uh, referred to as APLO within OpenShift, uh, which is the, the Klingon word for contain. What this has allowed is us to actually run GlusterFS in a containerized uh, manner. This allows us to scale out a storage cluster very rapidly. It also allows us to contain better the security around that. Um, and it has much more control and ease for the developer. We have created a, a way of orchestrating this uh, through um, Haketi, um, also an open source project, and it has a full integration with OpenShift Container Platform. So this is an exciting and new feature for Red Hat, and it's uh, also a very new concept within the community um, across the board in containers to have this type of storage available. Jeff, I'll pass it back on to you to talk about volume security, which I know everyone is very concerned about. Yeah, just uh, one piggybacking one other thing on Aaron's comment. One of the neat things about the um, Gluster, containerized Gluster is that it, you now don't need to worry. You don't. You can have your cluster. Cluster can be completely separate, like you probably have today, or it can be combined with your OpenShift cluster, which they call converged storage, and uh, and share the same nodes that your OpenShift cluster is using. But anyway, with Red Hat's emphasis on enterprise needs and satisfying requirements for enterprise customers, it's not surprising that um, security matters, and. Um, it's also typical that in the upstream community um, mindset, security is often uh, bolted on or thought of later. It's just feature, 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 and we worry about security later. But OpenShift and Red Hat doesn't quite think that way. Security is important, and we try to get it baked in correctly up front. And so um, storage has um, security concerns, obviously, you need to be able to allow uh, applications uh, access to the storage that they need, and at the same time, you need to prevent other users' uh, applications processes from gaining access to storage that you're trying to uh, keep them away from. And so we try to handle all those requirements within OpenShift storage, and uh, of course, we support SE Linux, and you'll see more details about that in, in, in the next slide. Um, we support POSIX permissions, um, and, um, and and there's some differences between block and shared devices and how that's done. Go ahead, Aaron. We, we meaning Red Hat, have submitted to Kubernetes uh, part of our, our code that is related to security. In OpenShift on the right-hand pane there, the we call it um, um, security construct, uh, context constraints. And it's a very rich set of features um, and descriptors that confine what a pod can do, uh, just uh, are a gateway to whether the pod can even uh, be created or not. And once a pod is created, what is that pod allowed to do, and what's the pod prevented from doing? Um, so we have uh, admission controller, we have authorization, 
we have the concept of roles and users and groups and projects. Kubernetes doesn't even have the concept of a user yet. They do have the concept of a project, and Kubernetes is called a namespace, but they don't have a user ID. They don't have role-based security. It's, it's um, fairly inflexible right now. Now, I think it's going to improve over time, uh, but right now, OpenShift is way ahead in terms of enterprise-type security. Um, uh, so we, we support POSIX permissions for shareable storage, and we support taking over devices, as you'll see next, for block storage devices. Um, let me see if there was any other notes I had on that. No, go ahead, Aaron, next slide. I'm just waiting for it to refresh on my screen. Um, so in SE Linux, you can see the bulleted list. These are the storage plugins or adapters that um, are SE Linux aware. Um, at the very bottom of this slide, you can just see a, a fragment of YAML, which um, has security context attribute, and it shows SE Linux options. And that's just the most common option is the level there, but you can, you can describe a user, you can describe roles, you can describe types, and those are all make up the SE Linux option portion of the security context. Um, as I said, the plugins you see bulleted there, those support SE Linux, and uh, those plugins happen to be for block storage, um, and, and you know what that means now. And what we do for SE Linux, and we also do it for um, group IDs, as you'll see soon, is we relabel the storage. Uh, we take it over, and um, the storage mount point on the host is the connector point, and that directory and all directories and files under it are relabeled with the SE Linux label that's provided in, in the pod. Now, the pod author doesn't need to know what that SE Linux label looks like. Uh, that could be defaulted for her by OpenShift through the security context constraints. So those constraints say, hey, if whether or not you can even define a security attribute in your pod, and if you can, what range you're allowed, what's legal, what's not legal. And if you're not allowed to, then the security context constraint will define a default value for you. Um, so the developer doesn't need to worry about those things. The cluster administrator can be the one concerned with security. Um, so just uh, I, the next slide, Aaron. I think it's supplemental groups. Um, a supplemental group is a, is a Linux POSIX concept. Um, uh, every process has a list of one or more groups, and it has a, a user ID these, and group IDs, right? And uh, you can or define what your supplemental groups are, and those are needed so that uh, if your group ID matches the group that the underlying file has labeled on it, then you have that access defined for that group. It's just POSIX permissions, essentially. Um, and again, just like with SE Linux, in OpenShift, the SCC, the security context constraint, is the arbitrator uh, and decides whether you can define your own group ID, uh, what values are legal, what the default is if you don't define it. And in this case, we just have an ID of one, two, three, four, but it could be, a, it's an array, it can be a list of IDs. Um, and this is for shared storage. So um, we don't take over shared storage, obviously. You don't want to have OpenShift altering um, attributes of your NFS or Gluster permissions. Um, so supplemental group is just a way of, of appending a group ID to the po uh, processes running in the container that's defined by the pod. And the last slide I think is coming next before Q&A. And it's FS groups. And um, it's very, underneath the covers, it's exactly like supplemental groups in the sense that we add a group ID to the process that's running in the container. Um, but because FS groups are targeted for block storage, and you can see the list of uh, plugins that support FS group ID, it's the same, not surprisingly, as the plugins that support SE Linux labeling. And we take over the device like we did for SE Linux relabeling, and so if you have a group ID defined in your pod or one defaulted on your behalf by your storage administrator, 
uh, then you get that group ID added to the list of group IDs that your process has uh, on the host it's running on, and then that will have an impact on your access to the physical underlying storage. So we call that taking over storage, and it only applies to these plugins, and they are all, they are block storage plugins. Never do it for shared storage. Um, Aaron, I think the next slide is just our generic question and answer slide. So I think that marks the end of our formal presentation and we're both ready to answer questions that you may have. All right, well, that was incredibly well done. So thank you, um, Aaron and Jeff for that. Uh, there is one question. Um, Yusheng is asking, is it possible to view storage being used, to use disk space? You cut out for a second there, Diane. Can you please repeat that? Uh, the, the question is in the chat. Is it, uh, it's from Yusheng, and it, is it possible to view the storage being used, um, at the used disk space in the storage, so the statistics, I think he's asking, on the storage? That Does that mean sort of like graphic, like seeing how much storage is consumed by a pod or a container? Is that? Let me unmute the gentleman. In real time? And let's see if we can sure. get him to follow up with that question directly. In the chat here, still in the PVC is what he's asking. Um, I think if you so, um, no, the PVC isn't uh, something that changes uh, in real time as your pod or application chugs around through storage and say creates appends to a file and makes it larger and larger and starts consuming storage. A P a PVC. Um, is doesn't have that purpose. Now, um, Aaron may have more experience in the in the in the OpenShift console to know what metrics might be exposed that would show you. So Kubernetes and OpenShift has a, a whole underlying framework of metrics, um, which gets exposed uh, to the console if it chooses to. It gets exposed to cockpit, which can be run on your node. But a claim or a PV. They don't, um, their, their purpose isn't to sort of show you real time snapshots of storage. Right. So, <clears throat> and just to add on to that, it. that is accurate. In the console, you can see how much you requested and actually how much um, was in the PV that it is bound to. Um, but, you know, you can't do um, a DF or anything on the PVC to see, you know, how much space you've actually consumed um, against what you've asked for. So that is, you know, being tuned as we speak, but today that capability doesn't exist. And in the chat, there's two more questions coming up. Yeah, I see for AK's question, which is a good one. Um, it's if a PV is created with 10 gig, but the claim is only 5 gig, and there's a one-to-one -one mapping, so that PV is not available. If any other claims, what happened to the remaining 5 gig that was, were defined in the PV? So it's important to know, and I, and I should have said this, I forgot, that when we define a PV today and we say it's a 10 gig PV and it's read only, say that's its access modes, it's natural to think that there's some enforcement going on by Kubernetes or OpenShift to make sure that um, the underlying storage really has 10 gig and that we don't use more than the 10 gig um, and then you, if you think that way, then you also feel that a claim that's only asking for half of it um, has wasted storage. But it turns out that's not true. The, the, uh, and Aaron maybe can, can fill you in more on quota that would more address that. Um, but these, the capacity in a, in a claim and the capacity or the size in the PV, you should think of those more as labels. And same with the access mode, read only or read write or read write once. Those are really labels or tags that describe the storage. Kubernetes and OpenShift aren't enforcing those labels as rules to the storage. That's done by a quota mechanism or something else that's in, that's part of the real physical storage. Um, Kubernetes and OpenShift are just using the capacity and access modes as a way of matching a claim to a PV resource. Just like Aaron's example of gold, silver, and bronze are labels to help match claims to PVs, 
Capacity and access modes are also labels from that perspective. Does that answer your question? So nothing is being wasted. I think it, it probably does. Um, Diego Castro has another question. Um, when will we be able to define IOPS limits? So with um, the idea of storage classes and storage selectors is the ability for the admin to have the IOPS defined um, as part of that taxonomy and then the user be able to claim against that. Um, there isn't a plan right now to be able to change the characteristics of, of the storage that's being used. It's just to um, properly expose what it is set at um, at the time. So here's one more question from Jonathan Lee. Um, will storage security integrate with Red Hat's SSO to key cloak work? Um, currently, actually, our team is looking at storage security. Um, we have a lot of different considerations to take into mind um, with uh, consensus within the community has not been reached as to how we handle the security. Uh, we would certainly entertain that possibility. We're looking at, you know, how to properly expose ACLs and keep those down, as well as looking at, um, you know, things like key cloak. Uh, but today that hasn't been firmed up. It'll probably be one or two versions down in OpenShift before we have anything that sophisticated. There's yet another question. This is quite good today. Um, in terms of this. Is there any way to recover a PV once it's been recycled. You meant uh, data stored previously before yeah. PV recycled. That's another good another good question um, because we didn't cover retention policies with PV. So you can define a retention policy when you define your persistent volume, and you can say I want it to be recycled, uh, I want it to be retained, which means unavailable but just there saved. Um, and you can say, I want it to be deleted, which means we would get rid of it. And that's more of something you would see with a dynamically provisioned storage. Here it is, and now I'm done with it, get rid of it. And um, the only storage plugin that supports recycling today um, is NFS. Um, so the question is, is there a way to recover a PV once it's been recycled? Um, I... Uh, so I described retention policies just briefly then, but I don't know what recovering a PV means. So maybe the person asking that question can define what they mean by recover a PV. Yeah, I will unmute and see if people. Yeah. If you unmute yourself, oh, Arvind, here's the answer. did it come up in the chat? Yeah, uh, is it audible to you? This is yep. Arvind. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, my question is, uh, for example, let's say uh, we have one PV which is currently used by a specific project. And uh, that project has stored, I mean, the parts which are specific to that project has stored some data in it. So uh, the project has been decommissioned now and the PV has been uh, re recycled. So after some days, I want to recover that data which has been uh, created by previous parts in that project. So is it possible, uh, I mean, uh, post recycling that PV, is it possible to recover that data? Um, not, not really. I mean, it would be difficult. And, you know, to be honest, we are going to be phasing out the idea of recycling in future versions. Um, there's already been a PR submitted about six months ago uh, to deprecate the recycling capability just because it, it leaves open the possibility of something like this. If you, you have a, a PV and you've set it to recycle and it's been set beside and waiting for delete, you know, you're opening up the possibility of someone possibly claiming that volume before the data has been deleted and reading it. So um, recycling is only supported, I believe, in Cinder and NFS today, and, and that feature will actually be phased out, um, you know, over the next six months. Okay, thank you. So if you want to keep the data, it's best to do retain instead of recycle. Yep, thank you. Yep, okay. Jeff, did you have something you wanted to add, add to that? This is Diane. Can, say I can, ask quick question here. can you change it from retain to recycle after you've allocated it? 
or back no. twice. No, you can't. No. I mean, I've never tried to do that. Um, I don't. There's an OC edit command. Uh, you could you could OC edit a PV, but I don't know if that sticks. Some attributes are changeable and others aren't, and I don't know about the retain policy. Well, it'd be a good thing to experiment with, so we could test it out. Are there any right. other I questions? Mean, the concern that... Go ahead, Jeff. Sorry to interrupt. Well, just a concern Aaron alluded to it, and it's important, is that we have to be careful in OpenShift when we're talking about storage and the end of uh, access, the end of the claim or the end of the pod's access, that if it's protected storage that no other claim and pod can come along there and start reading it. Um, and at the same time, OpenShift has to be very wary of doing an RM-RF on storage to clean it up, right? Um, you certainly don't want to make a mistake in executing that kind of command. So. There's a balancing act that we have to do in, in terms of this storage, and that's one of the reasons for recycling being uh, deprecated. It's a dangerous and potentially error-prone um, retention policy, and there's a risk of not only having the timing windows where someone can gain access to storage that they shouldn't, there's also the possibility of removing storage that shouldn't have been removed. Mm -hmm. There's one more that just popped in. Wallace is asking, what is the method to back up and restore a PVS a PVs, or the entire OSE cluster? You might have well, to so, uh, I think what Jeff had alluded to earlier in here is that, you know, currently snapshots are, are not supported. It is a PR that is uh, active in the community and being worked um, outside of Red Hat, but today we, we don't offer snapshots. Um, and most generally, um, if you use uh, a storage provider from Red Hat, like, like Gluster, you have replication. Um, so you're facilitating you know, the backup and retention of it through, through those means. But I think your question probably is around snapshotting and that, and that's coming in future releases. Yeah, and it's sort of a slippery slope for Kubernetes and OpenShift here to get more intimate with the underlying storage. Kubernetes is trying to stay above it, right? It's trying to keep that abstraction level well defined and not go into the nitty gritty of a particular vendor's storage solution. And so, there's a tug of a war going on there between trying to automate features and expose them through the Kubernetes APIs, which are, are very useful and give you a many benefits, versus having Kubernetes know too much about the underlying storage and therefore being more error prone, slower to, to be able to respond to enhancements that are made and so forth. So it's not an easy balancing act right now, and it gets discussed quite a bit in the storage community. All right, and yeah, I'm looking again. It seems um, there's a lull in the Q&A. If there's any other questions out there from all of you, um, you know, throw them in the chat or raise your hand. Give you a few seconds, minutes here. Um, is there anything else, Aaron or um, Jeff, that you'd like to add? Any reference sites or places to get more information in the future? Um, yeah, I mean, storage. there is actually quite a bit of documentation out on uh, the origin OpenShift, and feel free if people want to email or reach out to us or even, you know, send it to the mailing list for AOS storage, you know, we're happy to answer questions that way as well. All right, I'm still not seeing any more questions, so that just is a testament to the thoroughness of your presentation. Um, many thanks for um, all of your work in getting this together and coordinating with me on this one. Um, there will be more um, persistent storage as new features get added, and if there are other 
aspects of persistent storage that you'd like to hear more on, um, please reach out on the OpenShift Commons mailing list and I'll try and um, find a resource to, to do more deep dives on this. Um, this has been um, really educational for me and I hope so for everybody else. And um, we hope to have you guys back again, um, probably with the next release of OpenShift. And we will send the slide and the URL um, will be posted along with um, the YouTube video probably on Monday of next week on the OpenShift blog at blog.openshift.com. All right. Thank you, guys.